I come from the, uh, from the Gapminder Foundation, and we are a small nonprofit, and we are working to promote a fact-based worldview everyone can understand, just so you get an idea. And what we're working on is trying to make information like this easier to digest. And uh, you, need, you know, people actually be wanting to di digest it at all. And we've been trying to do that by developing softwares like this one, this one, this one, this one. And we have improved the search quality so you can search for public data. We're always working with the global public data. We've done videos and we've done school exercises. But doing this, we've been doing it for 20 years we realized gradually that there is something not working. Why isn't it working? Why doesn't people seem to listen that much? And then we started doing the exciting thing that is actually the starting point for the book. We started measuring what people know about the world. So, hold on. So this is me, Hans and Ola. And the embarrassing part here is that we have the same last name. And the reason for that is that Hans, professor of, uh, of global public health, he, uh, I didn't really pay attention to him, I have to admit, but when I was 16, I met Ola, and me and Ola, we wanted to become artists, and we didn't want to do anything that had to do with uh, his father, of course, because he was a, you know, an old man. We didn't think about that so much. But the thing with Hans was actually, while me and Ola were studying to become artists, Hans was complaining about his issues, getting the students to understand the world around them. And he started showing us attempts of communicating that, and we started helping him. And a few years later, we had actually invented the way of working together, which became Gapminder. So it was non-intentional, but too fun to resist, basically. So, yes. So in the book, we start by asking 13 fact questions. One of the questions is global climate experts believe that over the next 100 years, the average temperature will get warmer, stay the same, or get colder. Well get warmer is what most of the community would actually say is the sort of consensus going on right now, right? And we asked this in 14 countries, and here are the results. You can see most of these countries actually sort of got this. The communication has gone through. People know this. In France, we are going to compare you with France because that's I have to compare you with something, right? In France, 89% <laughs> actually got this correct. So what about you then? No pressure. But do you think you, you were doing better than the French? Yes. You actually did. Congratulations. You're actually better than everyone else in this session, right? So you're actually beating the Hungary as well. But then we end up... So basically, when we ask the question about the climate, everyone get, gets it. But when we talk about something else, about global trends and proportions, it's not as lucky anymore. How many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? Would it be 20, 50, or 80 percent? I mean, you can see it's far be between these different alternatives. And actually, 80 is correct. Looking at the results now, you see a completely different picture where France, only 6% scored correctly on this one. I mean, here people are not as confident anymore. And just imagine now if you would have asked this question to a chimp at the zoo, picking between three alternatives, the monkey wouldn't understand what you were saying, right? It would just pick one of the bananas. <laughs> you should end up here, 33%, right? It's a bit embarrassing in a knowledge society where people have high intelligence and high education still getting worse results than a random monkey at a zoo, right? <laughs> but actually, I was contacted by a researcher who was actually uh, working on behavior of monkeys. And he was surprised when he heard we said this because he said, monkeys usually pick the outer alternatives, which actually screws up our explanation here. So we have to remember to say we mix the banana between the questions, right? <laughs> because otherwise it doesn't work. But anyways, so what about now? Do you think you're still up in the 95 area or do you think you're more on par with the rest? Let's see. 
you're almost getting there. <laughs> you're actually beating Sweden, though, that is on top. So you're still better, but you still have a little bit to go, right? And I'm going to um, comfort you now, because we've actually done this in several different conferences. World Health Summit, experts in health, right? 27%. Davos, the big forum, 18. This is a meeting in Lindau, where medical Nobel laureates meet with the promising young scientists. <laughs> you, you could claim they should also know it, right? And this one, best for last. They, we, don't, we didn't write which bank because they were smart enough to say, sign an NDA before, you're not dis allowed to disclose our name. And that was a very smart move. But the thing here, this is not about blaming them, it's about pointing at the problem that we are highly educated, super smart people in all these organizations still getting the world as wrong as this. But we think we know, we're ignorant about our ignorance and relearning as an adult when we think we already know it is pretty tricky, right? So if we look at the overall results, this is not yours, but for the 14 countries we were measuring in our survey. 15% scored zero correct. And just imagining, you have 12 questions, A, B, C on each, and getting zero correct out of that, it's pretty impressive in a negative way, but still pretty impressive. This is where you should have ended up without reading the questions at all, right? One person scored 11, that was a Swede, we don't know who, and nobody scored 12. So, I mean, this is... The actual questions here might not be the importance in this case. The important thing here is to show the results are so bad, right? 10% of these people we were measuring in our survey got better results than random. Just think about that for a while. So, no pressure now, <laughs> but we're going to do the same with your results here. You still have a few people down here. I don't know if we should be happy or sad, but it's actually better than the general public. <laughs> so we're getting there. Wonderful. <laughs> and this is the results on the different questions. You can see you were actually uh, better than the chimp on some, and you still have some work to do on the others. So, but the question here now is not so much about the exact results of these questions, but trying to figure out how does people get it this wrong? This is a survey that YouGov did on audiences asking, do you think the world is getting better or worse? Pretty strange question, but I mean, as a general, looking at France again, 3% said the world is getting better. And if you have that as a mindset, and you're getting these fact questions about the world, most likely you're going to pick the worst, worst result of the ABCs, right? So what we see is that peop when people are guessing, they start thinking, and when they are thinking with a mind that thinks the world is getting worse, then we're going to pick worse results than what is actually happening. So we actually made 32 charts, you can find these in the book, just to remind people that if you look at long-term trends, a lot of things has actually improved. Not everything, but a few things have. I will show you some examples. Legal slavery has gone down. It's less likely to die in disasters we have almost removed lead from gasoline in most countries. Fewer children are dying. It's less likely to die in a plane crash than in the 30s. We have more movies to choose from. We have to remember that as well, right? More kids are being immunized. We have more music to choose from. And we have a bigger portion of the Earth is actually protected nature. Not saying everything is good, but at least things has improved in some areas, right? But when we look out the window, we can't see it. It's impossible to see those slow global trends by just looking outside the window. And too few people, as you might know, are actually reading all the research going on out there. So what are people doing instead? Most likely watching TV, right? 
you see disasters. You see wars, refugee crises, horrible diseases, nice paradises, cute animals, and exotic cultures. And you take these fragments and you try to build a worldview out of that. But the problem is, what you will see in the media will, of course, be the extraordinary events, which will make it hard to get a worldview correct. So, starting easy, think of the world as these four regions. Here, we have the world population, one billion figures, right? This is how the world population is distributed, roughly. And when we see this, we can actually have a PIN code for the world, because people can remember PIN codes, otherwise they couldn't use their own phones, right? This is the PIN code left to right, 1114, just to get a rough idea. We don't need the details in most things, we just need the overviews. Moving into the future, the population will change. More people in Asia, more people in Africa, and further into the future, even more people in Africa. So, when we think about the West that we so often talk about, basically in North America and Western Europe section of the world, in the year 2100, it's going to be 8% of the world population. This is where things will happen, right? So, to understand the world, we can think of it as four income levels. So, we have the poorest to the left, the richest to the right, and then we take the 7 billion figures again. And if we look at how the world population is divided by income, it's like this. The majority lives in the middle, but we usually hear about the, the level one and level four, the poorest and the richest. So if we look at transportation, just to get an idea about humans are the, the, the sort of normal human living conditions. On level one, the poorest in extreme poverty, if you're moving somewhere, or transporting yourself, most likely you will have to walk. Level two, you can use a bike. Level three, a motorbike. And level four, you might have access to a car. I mean, roughly, just to get an idea about the world, how people are living. And of course, we're up here, just by being in this room, I'm 100% sure that we have at least access to a car like that, probably something even nicer. We can see the same with food, how it goes, the typical plates of food on different incomes, going from being to completely uh, malnourished to the left, with very little variation, coming to level four, where we eat different things for the different meals a day, and vary between the days as well. And if we serve our kids the same dish two days in a row, we are a little bit worried they will get malnourished, aren't we, right? So, we have developed the tool that we call the Dollar Street, where we can actually go and see how people live. Because when we look at the statistics, we see line charts and we see bubbles and stuff, we can see the overviews, but how does people live? So, we started collecting imagery from homes all over the world and sorted them by income. We look at houses, we look at toilets, and we look at beds, and we order them by income, just to give a human side to income, so that it becomes more obvious what life is actually like for most people. We also do video clips looking at toothbrushing. We're starting at the richest end. Everyone here is using a plastic toothbrush and toothpaste, right? Doesn't matter where we are. As we move down into poorer and poorer uh, environments, some are very serious brushing, <laughs> but she's doing the same thing as the rest, right? But when we come down to the poorer end, finally people cannot afford a durable plastic toothbrush. They will start using a stick or their finger to brush their teeth. So in the Dollar Street, we tag the imagery by function people are, are using things for, right? Rather than uh, the name of it. So this one we tag as both a wall and a toothpaste. So we can see similarities. Here we look at two countries. They are far away in the, in the geography, but they are close in this sort of visual concept, right? We see two families, very different. Same type of beds, same type of brown leather sofas, and they both have a play structure outside, both made in China. We can do, <laughs> we can do the same in the poorer end. We can see two homes, Neighbors in this concept, but in reality not, right? Doesn't look like they have much in common. But look at their ceilings, their sofas, their grains, 
their fish they're going to eat for dinner, and how they are boiling water. By tagging imagery by income and actually comparing, we can see that cultural stereotypes are usually pretty stupid and they doesn't really make sense. In this concept, we can actually uh, remove them. So the imagery from inside homes tagged by income doesn't look like the imagery we see in the media. And this is where, if we break down where people live today, we can see the majority of the humanity lives on level two today. But moving into the future, if we just project into the future, most people will probably be on level three. So we see a majority of the world population moving towards better lives. So, so this was like a rough background with some fact frameworks. But to beat the chimp now, that might be what you're all worried about. Hans Rosling, the professor, he would have argued that if you just start studying everything about the world, the countries and the global proportions and trends, you will be fascinated and it will just be fun. Me and Ula, who were younger, we were a bit less convinced, thinking that it might be that people have other hobbies. This was Hans' hobby, but most people, they like to go out for drinks or, you know, go on soccer and stuff. So we have to figure out better ways of helping people to guess more correctly without learning everything by heart. And by the way, the world is changing. So if we learn everything by heart today, it will have changed in a few years from now as well, right? So first of all, you will need to have some facts and frameworks as a baseline. Other th without that, we're screwed. But most of all, we need to control our instincts. Because if we think the world is getting worse, and we're looking at data around us in the world, we will look for data that supports that. So we created 10 rules of thumbs, and they are the 10 chapters of the book, basically 10 dramatic instincts that we're trying to give rules of thumb to actually beat. I'm going to walk through them very, very, very briefly, and we can start with the gap instinct. Huge differences. We hear it all the time in stories, competing, conflict, and so on like this, poor and rich, and you know. But as soon as we hear something that it has a gap, we should remind ourselves that the majority is in the middle, and if we want to understand it, we have to look for the majority. We hear a lot of stories about things getting worse, but would an improvement get publicity? Most likely not. We never see this. Yesterday, all trains were on time again, right? It's not the logic. And when we see data like this, our brains are stupidly enough filling the line in like this. So we tend to think that we can see what's going to happen in the future. But just reminding ourselves then that many lines bend. I mean, it's ridiculously simple, but at least it helps us to actually uh, stay away from drawing the straight line conclusion. A lot of things we hear are driven by fear but we need to calculate the risk. We're afraid of spiders, but we get killed in traffic, right? Just balancing those. We hear a lot of stories, especially on a global scale, about problems, huge problems. But we need to compare and divide, because otherwise we have no idea. In UNICEF, uh, they reported in 2016, 4,489,000 infants died that year. I mean, it's a horrible number, awful you know, unacceptable. But putting it in context, 2015, worse. 1950, much worse. And just remembering that, by doing the comparisons, we can actually remember that it, the number 2016 is still bad, but it is better than it used to be. We need to have these two thoughts in our mind at the same time. Then we have the generalization we tend to think they are all the same, and we're very fast at making groups. We have all seen these. We have the refugees coming in their boats over the oceans. Yesterday, I think it was one boat that collapsed. You know, so tragic. And we, te we tend to be very uh, fast at thinking about them as being an homogen group, which they are, of course, not. People coming from all over ended up in a boat, risking their lives getting over the ocean. Now, I read in a Spanish newspaper, I don't read Spanish though, but I translated, <laughs> Google Translate, because one of these boats where the people at the boat actually survived, they reached the shore 
Unfortunately, they ended up here, at the nudist beach at Gran Canaria. And I'm just wondering, from their pers perspective, before they went into the boat, risking their lives to get to Europe, was this what they were hoping for? <laughs> Had someone warned them, right? <laughs> or even worse, since this was the first encounter, maybe, what would they think is a typical European, you know, just thinking about that. We have the destiny instinct as well, that we tend to think that everything will be static, that something, uh, something happening uh, in a country will continue to be the same way always into the future. But most things are moving, but slowly. Single solution, we like our ideologies and we try to keep to it and looking for, for evidence providing it. We love blaming. Problem is, when we start blaming, we stop thinking, which makes it a problem to be realistic, right? There might be other explanations. And worst of all, maybe the urgency instinct that we tend to think we have to act now or never. And when we feel that very strongly, there is a risk that we are doing big things in effect, which might not be the right things to do. We should slow down, go through the data once again and wait with decisions until we feel a bit more stable, right? So basically, you know, very, very basic, but this is a very quick run through of the rules of thumb. And Maybe when we're looking at the news, maybe we should do as with the cigarettes, put a warning sign just to remind us that we are actually, be, we, we become driven away. Even if the news are completely correct, there is a risk that our minds will just see the negative things. The same test you were doing here, you can do it online on our website, gapminded.org, and if you score all questions correct, which I bet you will now, if you do that, <laughs> then you will actually get a diploma like this in your mailbox with your name on it. But you can do it w over and over again, and we will not see you until you score correctly. That's when we're asking you to input your, your email. So until then, you're invisible, so don't worry. And we've been to the media and certified them. We've been to educational institutions, schools, and uh, you know, students, teachers on different levels. We have been uh, at, the, at the law firm in Sweden. That's the first law firm we've been to. And we've been at a startup. This one, which, which is called Norsken in Stockholm, what they do, which is pretty exciting, before hiring someone, they ask people, of course, to send their CV, not something special with that, but they also ask for the diploma on this particular test. Because for some reason, they seem to think that it's pretty good if their employees know a little bit more about the world than the chimps. I don't know. <laughs> and then what we're doing next is actually that we're creating, we now have thousands of questions about the world that we're setting up to do more specific tests in different topics. So that's what's coming. And if you think that, that the 10 rules of thumb are too complicated to remember, Remember just to be humble and curious and that we are usually ignorant about our own ignorance. And if we're just trying to be more humble and more curious, I think we can actually make a big difference. So if you want to know more, you can always find me at info at gapminded.org. And for the future, I'm pretty possibilistic, which is a word we put in the book. Not being optimistic, not being pessimistic, but actually believing that if we look at the data carefully and we're actually working hard, we can probably achieve most of the things needed to make the world a uh, you know, even better place. Thank you. Mm.